So I want to make sure that um, it looks that like we're live. <laughs> okay, we are definitely live. Um, well, okay, we are just about, we're like a few seconds before the top of the hour, but I just didn't want to take any chances. Um, anyways, I want to welcome viewers to uh, Facebook Live. And this is the, the, it's not our first Facebook Live, but it's our first Facebook Live for the new book, The Best New True Crime Stories, Well-Mannered Crooks, Rogues, and Criminals. Unfortunately, David can't flash his copy of the book because he doesn't have it yet. But, uh, <laughs> probably be get it in tomorrow's post. But I, I'm here today with David Breakspear, who's one of my contributors, and he's joining us live from the UK. Hi, David. Hi, Mitzi. Thank you very much for inviting me on. And um, it is a shame about the book, but it gives me something to look forward to anyway, that's for sure. Yeah, well, you know, maybe it's still on that rowboat, the, the, the postal <laughs> rowboat. Can you hear me? There you go. There we oh. go. Yep. That's very strange. Well, of course, why should everything go completely smooth? <laughs> you know, people, exactly. who, people who know me know that that just does not happen. Well, that's the three things now. I haven't got the book. Um, it, this, this streaming wouldn't work on the Apple Mac. So, and now you've muted. So we're good. We're good to go now. I don't know. Maybe I must. Maybe maybe my arrow did something weird. But anyways, we're here to talk about the new book. Um, but first, yeah. we were chatting. We were chatting in the green room a moment ago about your surname, Breakspear, and and uh, it's it's a really interesting name. And I was saying that I'm thinking of this Arthurian legend thing, and and you have a bit of a story about that. Yeah, you wasn't far wrong. Um, it's actually a surname that is in the Doomsday Book. Um, it goes that far back. Um, <laughs> It began life as the description of someone that was a successful jouster uh, back in medieval times. Um, breaking the spear on the other person would see you um, win, basically. Um, and over time, it come to mean uh, an overall successful tournament fighter. And then in the 12th century, uh, in the 1100s, 1152, 1153, around about that time to 1156 or 59, I can't remember off the top of my head now. Um, Nicholas Breakspear um, was the first and only English Pope under the reign of Henry II. Um, and he was Adrian IV. So there's a lot of history, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I do have such a love of history. Um, as I say, one of the reasons, you're aware of the other, which we'll no doubt talk about. But, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I... I suppose more, I, I, I kind of got into researching uh, more than writing. Writing come later, which again, I'm, I'm sure we'll cover. Well, I think that's really interesting. I, I mean, I wonder, you know, um, I mean, maybe maybe uh, it's it's more of an English thing about, you know, more of a love of history and appreciation, although probably that's fading and fading with each generation. Well, it wasn't school that inspired me, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> as as yeah, you're aware, I, I mean, I, I was... I was kicked out of the education system at the age of 14. So, but fortunately, I, I, it, it wasn't so much um, the learning. I, I, I love to learn. Uh, I still do, um, even though I'm approaching my 52nd birthday in September. But I do still have a, a love for learning. I have a love for researching. And, and kind of later on in life, it led on to the, to the love of writing as well. Well, I think, I mean, that's fantastic. I mean, you know, I, I, I can identify with that with the school business because that certainly my school days did not inspire me at all. No. <laughs> I couldn't no, wait no. to get as far, you know, as far distant as possible from that. But, um, well, we're going to chat about your story. You wrote a, a, a really interesting story called The Monk, the Brain and the Marlboro Diamond. Um, now, I, I kind of, um, it's, it's a, it's a, I call it a part mob story and a part dummy's guide to La Cosa Nostra. Yeah, um, and it, it, the reason, I mean, it was through a guy who um, we both uh, at the time were writing for the National Crime Syndicate, an online portal for, for uh, 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 mafia history, sorry, uh, Gary Jenkins, who yes. I'm, I'm sure you're aware from Gangland Wire. Um, and he asked me to um, play a part of a British prisoner about these two guys from the Chicago outfit um, who were in Pen uh, sorry Parkhurst Prison on the Isle of Wight in the UK, uh, just off the coast. Um, and he wanted me to play this fictitious character within a true story. 
um, basically I was going to be in prison uh, because of my experience of prison, which no doubt we'll get to. Um, and I was banged up with the two characters. Um, so it was kind of how I was aware of this information was uh, I played the part of a listener who one of the guys are, spoke to. So I knew what was going on between him uh, and Jerry, who was the other character. Um, and it, it become quite fascinating because one, what was the Chicago or two out uh, members of the Chicago outfit and quite sensible members of uh, members as well. I mean, Art um, had a huge IQ. Um, they were quite concerned about his IQ in prison. Um, but, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and it was more to do with the fact that why have they come to London uh, to commit this, this robbery? Um, and as people will find out in the book, they didn't exactly hide who they were on the way over or why they were here, um, which, of course, led to them uh, being caught before they landed in Chicago with the goods. Um, so it was, uh, uh, sorry, not uh, without the goods. Um, they disposed of the goods en route uh, and no one is sure of, of what happened. But for me, when I, I looked into the story, the only thing that made sense was that they got the wrong diamond. Um, and um, for me, that that is an inter the interesting part of the story. I mean, it's all interesting. Of course it is. <laughs> I wrote it. I'm biased. But um, that, for me, is the really interesting part is why did two members of the Chicago outfit come all the way to, to London when there's enough jewellery shops uh, uh, in America and do it the way they've done it it's, it's, um, without trying to give too much away? Hopefully yeah. I haven't. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's 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 almost comical in, in a way, and and uh, obviously we'll, we want people to read the book and read the story to see how yeah. comical it is. But um, uh, explain a bit now. Um, obviously, they're with the Chicago uh, outfit, but uh, the monk and the brain. Who who is the monk and who is the brain, and why do they have those names? Um, well, the art was the brain. I mean, the brain it was easily come about because of his IQ. I mean, the guy was just hugely intelligent. I can't remember the reason for the monk, actually. I really can't remember that. I think, I think, I think that I, he wanted to uh, go into the priesthood, right? Wasn't yeah, that it, it, yeah, it was something like that. But you normally find that it's the media and the uh, local law enforcements that do provide the nicknames. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, Al Capone didn't like to be called Scarface and no one called him <laughs> it to his face. Uh, <laughs> apparently with, with your, uh, one of your previous contributors, uh, Christian Cipollini, expert on Lucky Luciano, no one would call Charlie Luciano lucky around him. It was, it was again, something that was given to him. Um, so, and it was also given to him. I suppose, wrongly with what the common knowledge is because people think that it was because he was he, he kind of was saved after a beating, but it was something he had tattooed on him from a child, uh, from a young age. So um, it was something he's always been known as. Uh, but, yeah, the, the media kind of, and, and not a lot of them um, enjoy it, to be honest. But it's, it's, it was done in a way to dehumanise it because... Yeah. They, they were becoming cult heroes. They, they, a lot of guys received cult status. So I assume, um, and, and with a little bit of research, of course, that it was done because of the fact they wanted to dehumanise uh, members of the mafia and, and take away, if you like, that Robin Hood uh, image. And, and that's why they ended up with, the, I suppose, some of the more questionable uh, nicknames that uh, really do kind of, pick on their disabilities, if you like, and their afflictions, um, which in any other walk of life would be considered unfair. But um, considering they were just members of the mafia, according to the media, then they could call them what they liked. Yeah, in a way, it's taking them down a peg or two. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. Not, um, knocking on high horse, whatever you want, <laughs> euphemisms. Yeah, but I mean, it's always really been synonymous with with kind of organised crime, hasn't it? Nicknames and things like that. So, um, 
Yeah, yeah you've I mean, some really it, colorful nicknames that you've mentioned from other characters who are, aren't the main characters, but when you go into the discussion about, you know, the Chicago mob and, and, and the history behind it, the, there's some bizarre names. I mean, like cringeworthy names and why these yeah, people exactly. have names. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And as I say, it was mainly done to, and the problem is as well, they stick. Um, uh, and they stick for a reason because they stick because they kind of describe the person that it is that they're talking about. So you do find that a lot of those nicknames really stick. And rather, I mean, um, John Gotti uh, was invariably ever since been called a Teflon Don. Um, more so he's back to John Gotti again these days because obviously there's, there's a kind of generational shift since um his time during it during the uh, being boss of the gambino family so um yeah they they, they kind of i suppose yeah they, they they provide a little bit of fun for us put it that way <laughs> yeah 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 um what what specifically i know you mentioned your love of history but why are you so enthralled with the mob what what is it about the mob that just appeals to you as a subject matter um with with hindsight, it wasn't something I realised at the time. It was something, obviously, in later life that I can look back on and, and, and kind of fully understand. But when I was a younger child, I was, I was 10 years old. I, I didn't have a great... I, I'm going to say I didn't have a great childhood. I had a brilliant upbringing. Um, I, I didn't have no problems in the home at all. Most of my problems were outside the home. And um, at the age of 10, I was kind of struggling. Uh, I was looking for an identity, um, I just suffered uh, meningitis, quite a serious illness, of course. And I, I was in, a, mentally, I suppose, I was in a bad way. Of course, as I said, as a 10-year-old, I didn't understand that part of it. And that's something I understand looking back. But at the time, uh, <clears throat> and I, I, I see uh, someone, had, for me, uh, escaped from prison. Uh, it was Charlie Richardson, who was part of the Richardson gang, um, someone that the press uh, monikered with the torture gang, which was a little bit over the top, considering some of the stuff that happened afterwards, where it was proven that one of the main witnesses basically made his story up uh, or embellished it somewhat um, because he was being threatened by the by the police over here. So there's no difference to that side of things here to what there was uh, or what there is in America uh, in respect of law enforcement and some of the, the tricks, if you like, that they play. Um, fighting fire with fire, if you like. And he had, he had, well, I thought escaped from prison, but it was Spring Hill and it was an open prison. Um, but as I say, for me, it was two fingers up at the establishment. I didn't know what an open prison was. Um, it was just someone that was like, wow, who is this geezer? And over the years, um, I kind of got to know a little bit more and we're going back to, as I say, the early 80s and Fortunately, my nan, who I'd visited a lot back then, um, lived literally 50 yards away from the library. So it was really something that was my own thing. It wasn't something I shared with others. Um, it was just my little, I suppose, escape. Uh, and it was, only, it was more reading up than researching. Um, I didn't know what I was researching, of course. And back then it was microfish, um, which is really, was really interesting. And over the years, it's something that, I, I read somewhere that Charlie Richardson would have been someone from Britain who would have fitted in with the Mafia. Um, unlike the craze, they were a little bit more crude uh, in their way of dealing with situations. Um, they were more kind of, I suppose, the craze were more like Murder, Inc. Um, than they were kind of bosses themselves, if you like. Um but with uh, Charlie, Charlie had a little, there was just something about him. There was just something about his car. And I thought, who the mafia? <laughs> um, and lo and behold, that. And then over the years, obviously, as I said, I didn't have a brilliant childhood. And uh, my, my, my younger years weren't great. And not many of my adult years were either. But, and I ended up in custody quite a lot. And those were kind of the books that I would read. And I'd read up on them. And as life progressed and as I got I suppose more emotionally mature and grew up a little bit and and uh, wanted to change my life. Something I found uh, in prison that was quite cathartic, um, as well as something I enjoyed, was just 
rather than researching, was writing about certain subjects as well. Um, and it all began with my kind of want for campaign and, and, and for prison reform, but that's something obviously we can come back to as well. I'm going to be coming back to a lot. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I, I need to be very careful because if I start going off on a tangent, we're going to be covering oh, oh, who knows what. So I'm trying yeah, to stay on. I'm, I'm starting I'm to start, I've got myself a little structure. <laughs> uh, that's that's no that's just interesting i mean uh because I, I mean a lot of people who write true crime have their sort of um little niche area and they just really really um keep revisiting that and and that's just their thing so it's just interesting to hear that um so uh so as far as your story with the monk in the brain now the monk is uh joseph jerry Scalise, right and then yep. uh, arthur rachel is the brain yep now, um, now these chaps were quite active in, in Chicago, but um, <laughs> give us a little overview about why these guys in Chicago decide to fly off to London and, and steal jewels at a, at a posh Knightsbridge jeweler. What's up with that? That's what, that's, that's what I really do not understand. And... The, again, the way that they've done it, I, again, I, I'm really uh, mindful not to give too much away because of what I I believe were the reasons why. I mean, I believe that they stole the wrong diamond. Um, and, and and obviously I provide the backstory as to why I believe that. Um, and I think it's what I, the information I provide is slightly more credible in one aspect um then just yeah, they were too sensible to commit the crime the way that they committed it um it was done in a way that well if we get away with it we get away with it and it you just <laughs> yeah i mean it just beggars belief how they even thought they were going to get away with it um i don't know if they th I suppose looked down on the British people and thought that that just their presence would scare them, like anybody in America who understands. I suppose Chicago is is something more used to than what London is. Um, so were they shocked that people actually did witness them and speak to the police and, uh, 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 so quickly as well after the crime had been committed? So it's really. It is quite an interesting um, story on its own as to the way the crime was committed and, and why they used their own names. Um, I suppose that's not giving too much away. No, uh, that's why they used the yeah why they <laughs> used their own names to to book the flight, the hotel, and the hire yeah. car that they done the robbery. Well, and I, I really done, don't know, but the like, fact that they didn't get it. caught with <laughs> the fact that they didn't get have anything on them when they returned to Chicago other, other than a few bits and pieces. Um, it's as if they, they knew they were going to get caught and, and throw the scent off, but was the right diamond sent back um, in the way that obviously I, I write in the book that the way that the diamond was sent back to Chicago? Um, and then what happened to it? Where did it go? That's the one, that's the mystery that no one really knows is what actually happened to that diamond. Um, so it just, it, it, and, and it's everything about my love for the history of organized crime is that the, the stories, the, the fact is so much bizarre than any fiction you could write. And yet you get people that actually do try and twist things uh, slightly from the truth and we get a different version of the mafia um, and when you kind of scratch beneath the surface you, I suppose up until the end of Carlo Gambino when everything started to fall apart they haven't really been anything of, of, of much I don't want to put myself on any hit list or anything but uh, I think people agree that that kind of was the end of the uh, the beginning of the end after Carlo Gambino had gone because he was, I suppose, one of the the the, the most old school that was left and, uh, and come from the uh, was first generation, come over from Sicily when he was nineteen. He was a made man at sixteen, 
Carlo Gambino. So um, I just think the history of everything and the stories that the history of organised crime presents us with. Just, I mean, I get lost for hours researching sometimes. I go onto the FBI website, onto their, their um, archives, and, and I can get lost for, for just days. Um, and I forget what it is that I went on there for in the first place. Um, so it's just, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's what, for me, the, the story behind the Marble Diamond just uh, highlights everything that's just mysterious about the Mafia and the, and the Chicago outfit, but it also highlights, the, as you say, the comical side of it. Would you say then uh, these these two guys are pretty much old school mobsters then, right? They they were you, they, they came around when would they <coughs> they started their career? Well, yeah, I mean, well, look at what they've done afterwards. I mean, um, I think Jerry's back in, or he, or he's still in, and he's coming up to his eighties. <laughs> Uh, they they come out and they they try to burgle um, and, and that was one of the parts that I played in the story that in Parkhurst Art was telling me in, in private that when he and Jerry got out they were planning this burglary because um, they wanted to get the diamond back from their boss uh, um, Angelo Di Del Piero I can't, Del Pietro can't ever get his surname right um, the hook. Um, so, um, yeah, he uh, and their daughter, his daughter was at the house. It was, it was a very bizarre set of offence that um, the police were already aware of uh, because they caught them on, on um, wiretap um, setting up the job. Um, so they were banged to rights and the police were waiting for them. And he got put away for quite a while for that and Art was with him. And I, I think they're, they're in their seven, around about their mid-70s now. Uh, and as I say, they, I think they they were due out for prison. I'm, I'm not sure if Art's out, but I know Jerry due out very, very soon. And he's not going to give up. He's going <laughs> to carry on looking for that diamond. Um, no, that guy is, right. yeah. I mean, that guy's got such a story behind him anyway. And it's just, con and, and in a way, yeah, look, I'm not glorifying what the mafia are about. Of course I'm not. I'm just, it's just everything around it really that, um, goes on. It's just, it's just incredible. And in a way, I mean, I suppose America bore it upon itself with with prohibition. Um, <laughs> I mean, that was the the real huge growth behind the mafia in America because it, it made them more organised and um, they were able to create networks across America, which after prohibition um, was used for drugs. I mean, it was, it was the the paths were already there for them. So. Um, in a way, it was the prohibition was one of the best things to happen for organised crime. Um, and in a way, it kind of, I suppose, cushioned America through the Depression. Uh, and unfortunately, the Mafia kind of took over. But it was built on, I mean, the Mafia really were built over here, were built on the, uh, sorry, in America, were built on the back of politicians utilising local gangs um to to do their bidding for them and and to make sure that they won the vote in the area that they were working and all of a sudden the mafia started having a little bit more too much power and, and started taking over in the halls of power um especially in new orleans where where kind of it all began if you like which for me um a lot of talks about the new york five families and the commission and the kind of american mafia being but the Chicago outfit, the New Orleans Mafia. There, there's there's a lot more history around than just the New York Mafia. Yes, I, yeah, I think a lot of people always uh, just assumed it's you know New York, and then it's suddenly uh, there's another story in the book as well, which um, is uh, about the Philly mob, and then right. Atlantic City. So it's like it, it, people don't realize it. So they, they just think it New York, and then you know, especially if. It, it's been kind of an icon in films. It's always like the New York mob and, you know, all of that. Yeah, of course. And you've got the Los Angeles mob as well, which yes. is um, through the Dragner family, uh, Jack Dragner, who is the great, great grandfather of J. Michael Niotta um, himself. I, I know through National Crime Syndicate. So um, I'm fortunate that um, there's some with Christian Cipollini as well. And of course, Seth Ferranti that, uh, and Alan Lindblom, there's guys around me that I can kind of uh, uh, approach for advice and, and 
Yeah, it's like a big family, really. Uh, the <laughs> it's a family. Like a big family. It's indeed the mob family and the mob writing family. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it very much is. It's just a shame that I'm over here in the UK because obviously everyone's over there in America. There's not too many mafia writers uh, um, that are based in the UK. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, as I say, they're all over in America. So I've, yeah, I'm going to have to get the out craze. there one day. You have the craze, <laughs> the Cray brothers, you know. That's what <laughs> yeah, did we? Um, I, I mean, compared to, again, compared to Charlie Richardson, the craze, for me, this is going to get me into trouble, but they, they couldn't polish his boots. Um, <laughs> and um, th there's a lot more. I mean, they, they, were, they were psychotic. Um, yeah. Roy, I mean, Charlie Richardson. Yes, he was feared, but he was he he kind of, if you like, bossed by respect. He didn't need to to kind of go, and yet he still got twenty five years. Um, didn't kill anybody, and he got five years less than the craze. It's because Charlie got into the establishment, and they didn't like that. Yeah. Um, he was in he was in places that he shouldn't be from from his background and. And and because I mean it was his brother Eddie and, and Frankie Fraser really that were kind of the the if you like the the ones that done the typical gangster stuff the the jukeboxes the fruit machines cigarettes all that sort of stuff and um, no there weren't a lot of drugs as such um, but that's what they were kind of into and the scrap and, and Charlie was more scrap metal uh, and then he got into if you like the stocks and shares and and, and diamond mines in Africa so I mean that's that's the sort of thing the mafia would do, do you know what I mean? They they kind of diversify it. But with the craze, they were just beating up local people and, and, and yeah. taking money off of local businesses. Um yeah. so yeah, I mean they 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 did. I mean, they didn't rule for that long either, really, when you look at it. It was only a few years that they were around. Um and um I mean, even but some of the people that worked for the craze, I mean Tony Lambriano, Chris Lambriano, they were class as well. Um, that they were all right again. I'm not glorifying what they done, but that they were proper villains. They were proper old school villains that that did it the right way. <laughs> if you can say did it the right way, they did it the right way. Um, and for me, the craze didn't. They just ruled by just by fear and and obviously some of the stories behind what they got up to as well doesn't sit well. So um, yeah. It, they're like, but that's the thing with a craze. You either love them or you hate them. Um, there's no real, there is, there's a decision to come to when it comes to the craze. Um, whether or not you have a, an interest as, as kind of passionate as some people's or not, um, some people still do have their views on the craze. But um, yeah, for me, it's always been Richardson's over here. Um, and, 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 as, and kind of the Chicago outfit, I, I just love um, what the Chicago outfit are about, Tony Accardo. Um, Joe Batters, <laughs> that was his nickname, or the Big T because of a tuna that he caught. Um, I mean, so his, his weren't too. I mean, Joe Batters is what it is because he'd done people with baseball back years ago, and um, and Big T because of the tuna. So some do get decent nicknames, <laughs> ones they don't mind too much either. <laughs> Oh, um, just to, just to kind of give us an idea, um, because you in your story, you know, the, the bit about the, the diamond is the whole point of uh, the, yep. the theft here. Um, just give us a bit of an overview of the marble diamond. What what is up? What is um, about this diamond that was so special? And and as far as its value, what was its value? Well, the the, the marble diamond. You've caught me off. I know it's quite a few million. I think it was in the forty millions or something. I can't remember off the top of my head now. That's caught me. Um, what's its name? Um, but the marble diamond itself belonged to, or or belonged to the William uh, Winston Churchill family, um, and of course belonged to the Duchess of Marlborough. Um, uh, and oh, I can't remember how long ago we're going. And <clears throat> there's, again, there's a story behind that as well. Um, about the marble diamond, how the marble diamond came to be, how it ended up um, being auctioned. Um, again, which is quite a sad story, and I'm trying not to give too. I'm trying again. I'm trying to not remember it all. I'm trying not to give too much away at the same time. I can't remember the value of the diamond though. That's. I'm sure it's around. I, I'm probably talking today's value, but I think it was around about forty-four million or something like that dollar, uh, dollars. Um, hopefully, I'm close. <laughs> yeah, that's that's not exactly a, a pocket change, is it? 
it's well, it's it, it's a good few million dollars. I mean, we're we're not talking, yeah, we're not talking uh, a wedding ring. I mean, we're we're talking something with uh, huge historic value. And if they stole the diamond that I thought that they were going after, I mean that the history that surrounds that is what led me to kind of believe and again with with the story behind uh the other diamond that's what led me to believe that there, there may be something else going on here yeah yeah well you paint an interesting uh you you, you put in an interesting argument about it potentially being the wrong diamond i've actually mm. got a comment here and someone is asking about um uh, how much of this heist gone wrong is already known or is your story a new telling of what happened um it's I suppose it is a new telling because no one's, I've not seen anything about that's mentioned. I mean, it was quite difficult to research. Um, it took me quite a, a while to get a lot of the information. I want, obviously want to make sure that it was uh, as accurate as I possibly could make it. Um, so although it may not be a new telling of the story that took place, because at the end of the day, there's only one telling of one story. Um, there is a lot of information that, kind of I've been able to get hold of and put together that I, I'd like to think makes it a unique telling of a, of a kind of old tale, if you like, because it does come from 1980 when the robbery took place. So um, they, 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 to be honest, there wasn't a lot um, that I could find on it that were the full story. As I say, it was something from here, something from there. Um, and as you know, I mean, uh, uh, um, uh, some of it was the uh, actual official FBI files, which um, I was fortunate to get. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to think it's unique. Yeah. OK. Um, and now, um, I mean, the main point of our book is um, it's well-mannered crooks, rogues and criminals. Now, uh, these could be uh, mannerly criminals. It could be people with codes of ethics, even if those codes are we may not agree they're ethical, but they do, or moral codes. Um, in, the whole point uh, in this particular story is that um, they never actually owned up to anything. They never gave any information. And uh, they basically used the code of silence, uh, which is a widespread code in the mafia. Tell us a bit about what that is. Um, that's, that's quite a, a coincidental, actually, because I had a conversation on someone with Instagram earlier about it, saying that um, I, I kind of don't understand. Um, obviously, a murder is, is the code of the mafia. It's the code of silence. You take an oath and you, you swear a murder that um, you don't speak um, about family business outside the family, basically. Um, you don't snitch. Um, but it's 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 kind of... Uh, over the years become quite muddied. Obviously, you have people that swear to it, but as soon as they face jail time, they're straight away singing like canaries. Um, <laughs> and the thing is as well, I mean, it's in one aspect, some of it is quite comical, but in other aspects, excuse me, in other aspects, it is quite serious as well because um, I'm very much as someone, uh, well aware of someone that... that uh, Sammy the Bull Gravano had murdered. And um, this isn't kind of new news, if you like. Uh, Alan Kaiser, when he was a 14-year-old child. Um, so, uh, uh, the, uh, and Alan's family haven't had justice yet. But for admitting to 19 murders, he ended up getting five years. And he'd already spent four years on remand. So he ended up doing a year uh, in prison for 19 murders uh, for turning on his family. So... And also, you, there were others that utilised the feds for their own gain. So um, you had people like Whitey Bulger, uh, who was a, an Irish gangster from Boston, who utilised by becoming a government informant or, or an informant for the feds, he was taking out mafia members um, rather than do it through fighting. He'd done it through the feds. Um, and... Uh, Others were using the feds to clear out their own territories. Um, they'd put other people up, um, which a lot goes on. So, again, it's, it's – if you're not – I mean, one of the, 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 the criteria for becoming a made man in the mafia, 
there's obviously a few criteria, but one of the criteria is you don't have law enforcement in your family. And yet they utilise law enforcement left, right and centre. But claim them, it's, it's a strange one. It's a very strange one. But yeah, I mean, back in the day, um, it, it, it's for, for me, it was the, the drugs that I suppose ruined it for the, for the mafia because of the, the amount of time and, and, uh, and through RICO, which was introduced in 1970. Um, when RICO and the drug, the, the, the length of sentences for drugs were introduced, which was around about the time of the end of Carlo Gambino, that was the beginning of the end of the mafia because, uh, and if you look, the, the FBI as well, they, they began to fight really dirty. Uh, I mean, they, they really did start to fight dirty. Um, can you blame them in one aspect? Probably not. Um, however, uh, when you're upholding the law, how far are you allowed to, to kind of push that line before you're yourself breaking the law? Um, and I think federal agents across America would um, have broken many laws in pursuit of organized crime criminals. And, and one thing that also makes me laugh is, is that these, these snitches or rats, as everyone calls them, which they are, I suppose, um, when they do sit in the court dock, they never sit in the court dock as, as a witness for the defence because the prosecution would never allow it because they'd be considered unreliable witnesses. Yet when the prosecution bring them out, they're allowed to say whatever they like to whoever is listening. Um, and yet they're deemed reliable in the information that they give. Um, and someone for me that I suppose epitomises that is Valachi. I, I don't believe that at the McClellan hearings that um, Valachi knew as, as much as he knew. Um, I mean, there is evidence that he could only identify about 69% of the people that the FBI had up on their, their um, family boards when uh, shown at the, the, the McClellan hearing. Um, so, uh, again... It was for me, he was more given a narrative what the FBI wanted him to say. Um, there, there was no way that someone um, of Valachi's status would have known everything, I don't think. As I say, he didn't. Um, and it's, it's proven that he didn't know everything. So if he's, if, if he's being coached for some of it by the FBI, why couldn't he have been coached for a lot of it by the FBI? So um, again, it's that's all part and parcel of, of the beauty of organised crime uh, and the mafia. I mean, it doesn't just, it, this isn't just uh, isolated to the American mafia or the Canadian mafia or, or the Chicago outfit or, or the Russian mafia, Sicilian mafia. It's all of them um, because once they're faced with that decision, uh, a lot of them don't fancy spending the rest of their lives in prison. Um, don't get me wrong, there are those out there that still do. Uh, and do still go through the code um, and and do their bird in the right way, if you like, uh, keep their mouth shut and live long and happy lives. Whether it, I mean, one of the, um, um, Vinnie Gorgeous, his name is, um, if you see some of the photos of him from, from federal prison, the guy looks like he's doing six weeks and he's doing life without parole. I mean, and, and he hasn't said a word to anybody. He's doing, he's doing his sentence the right way. So and and our our protagonists, the, the monk and the brain, were the same. They just they kept to their code. They did not squawk. Yeah, a, look, a lot don't. A lot don't say anything. It's just that we get to hear about the ones we do. And yeah. if you like, from our side of the fence, I'm glad that they do because it it gives us more information to be able to research. Yes, um, it gives us an opportunity to sometimes get that full picture. Um, and, and to be able to add two and two together to make four instead of five. Yes, yes, yes. It keeps you busy too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so actually, um, so uh, we have a rather interesting situation here because uh, your journey from the past to where we are now and your story in this book is, is a rather unique and interesting one. Um, you alluded to it a bit earlier, but uh, do you want to tell us a bit about your background and how you got to where you are now? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I, I kind of fell foul of the law myself uh, a number of times. I, I spent 
uh, over the years from, from the first time I went away was 1985 uh, and the last time was 2015 and in between there was seven, seven, eight cent prison sentences over the period of time. Um, and it was, in the end, I kind of grew up, <laughs> I got too old for it all. The way that you used to do prison is you, you can't do it like that anymore. It doesn't work like that anymore. So um, in 2015, I found myself at my rock bottom. Um, I was addicted to drugs. I was on crack, heroin, uh, amphetamine. I was homeless and I was in a bad way. And I, I knew that the one place that I could go to go and fix myself was in prison. Um, but it wasn't worth just going back to fix myself. It was also, especially considering my age, I was, what, 40, uh, 46 at the time, 45, 46 at the time. And so considering my age, and I had to give myself purpose. Uh, I had to give myself a future. And over the years, I've become a better person in prison, I, uh, but only in prison. I couldn't bring it out here. I, I, I kind of didn't really enjoy life out here. I, 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 I don't know. I, I never really, I, I can't remember the last time I participated in my life, if you like. I just kind of lived um, uh, and not always in the right way. Um, and I admit that I, I got a lot of things wrong. I wasn't a nice person um, to a lot of people. Uh, I did some some bad stuff and some naughty stuff. Um, so I kind of deserve everything that I got in respect to prison. I'm, I'm not bitter and twisted at that. Um, and But whilst I was in prison, I'd become somewhat of a campaigner in there. Um, back in 2005, I'd become a mentor for an organisation called Shannon Trust. And they train prisoners who can't read. Uh, sorry, they train prisoners who can read to teach prisoners who can't read to read. And... Um, such a fantastic organization that I got involved in. And once I started on the route of mentoring, it, it, it started getting, to, I started to understand myself a little bit more. Uh, I, I'd, I'd done a little bit more uh, in respect to that type of work in prison and got a deeper understanding. But then it meant that that personality I had worked in prison it kind of didn't work out here. I couldn't separate the two. And that's what I wanted to do this time. And I wanted to carry on with the work that I was doing in respect of campaigning for reform um, because at the end of the day, we, we need to have a criminal justice system that works because people are coming home. So we don't want people coming home still broke. What's the point of a prison sentence otherwise? And unless you're going to lock everyone up and throw away the key, and then the next thing we know, there'll be HMP England at the docks of Dover because we'll just be one prison. So we need to do things and we need to make changes and we need to do it for the right reasons. And and, and that's something that I, I really felt passionate about and wanted to do in respect of having this new purpose. And there was a lot of things that I needed to do. And one of those was how to get my writing right, how to kind of build an argument, how, can to, how to construct an argument. And one of those things, I'd, I mean, I've been writing for a number of years but nothing too serious or, or anything published or anything like that, more for enjoyment. And, and then um, so I embarked on a, a degree uh, because I didn't have an education or a prison education. I had to start with an access module with the Open University, uh, understanding people work in society. And that went on for me to do a degree, uh, a Bachelor of Honours in Criminology and Psychological Studies. Because it was more about, I had this lived experience uh, and I had this passion, I had the voice and I wanted to put everything together in a way that I could do it the right way. Um, in prison, you do things a certain way and it doesn't actually always work out here because it was more about, uh, it was it was quite aggressive uh, and quite activist more than kind of campaigning. So, um, and on the back of that, um, come this side of it, um, I, I kind of utilise uh, social media when I come out for, the I suppose, the first time ever, really. Um, and that's, I, I went through, ended up on Facebook with a group, uh, Gangsters Now and Then, and then I got my own uh, organised crime group called uh, Global Mafia, which is where I met a guy called Rob uh, Balo. Uh, I think I, Rob Balo, yeah, that's it, Balo. <laughs> oh, Rob, sorry, mate. Um, so um, 
and he had a group on Facebook called a murder. And from a murder, I, 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 a murder was was kind of where everything for me became quite professional in what I did. Um, it was yes, it's a Facebook group, but it was a Facebook group that was taken seriously by the people that ran it and by the people that were members of it. So I kind of had to up my game, and and then come along National Crime Syndicate. Um, who I began writing for and, and again improving because I'm self-taught. But the more you do something and the more you get it out, the, the kind of, I suppose, the more you can receive the criticism <laughs> um, if you can take certain criticism. Uh, but it makes you a better person and, and it made me a better writer, I hope, um, over time. And um, here we are today, um, kind of yeah here we are today on the back of all of that <laughs> yeah that's it's really uh, uh inspiring because you know I mean, you're you just your your whole story and how you changed your life um you've actually done some high profile events i mean you've done some talks ted ted talks right and and didn't you recently do a virtual event for the <laughs> european commission was it uh yeah i i i done tedx that was at the open university um with this Shannon Trust, I spoke at the House of Commons um, with their CEO, Angela Cairns, um, although she's now CEO of an organisation called Unlock. Um, I've, I've called, yeah, I, I, I spoke at a magistrates event. Uh, magistrates, I don't know, they're, they're, they're kind of just the court underneath our Crown Court, which is, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the equivalent in America. Um, do you have magistrates in America, kind of lower courts, not judges, basically? They're, they're lay people um, that normally retired or, or GPs or something, that kind of industry, um, and three of them sit. They, they don't have to have – it's based on morals, I suppose. I don't know really what it's about. But, yeah, they, they can send you to prison, put it that way. So that was quite a surreal experience. Um, and, yeah, I, I've done some – it's the – European Association for Prison Education, um, which is through the European Association of Adult Education. Um, they're both uh, funded, uh, sorry, they're both backed by an organization called Erasmus Plus, which is funded by the EU. So, uh, and, and, and that's been about kind of my journey in prison and about volunteering and how important volunteering was in kind of helping me turn my own life around, if you like, in prison. So, that it's yeah it's it's been quite i mean i've been out just over four years and it's been an absolute incredible amazing journey i mean it's had some ups and downs and in that respect i just want to say i want to actually dedicate this one to my good mate jarmaine uh love you jarmaine rest in peace brother um who sadly we lost uh friday night um he's also a colleague at revolving doors agency we're part of the lived experience team together so he meant he, he meant a lot to a lot of people so um it's as i say there's been a lot of a lot of downs but there's been a lot a lot of ups and, and it's just been incredible that um what's been going on and, and I, I i keep my feet on the ground because I've, i i it's actually quite surreal for me all the time as well um it's like i, I don't expect things i i, I wake up I wake up in the morning sometimes and open my email and I'm bouncing around my kitchen like a ten year old child because I'm like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Um so yeah, it's it's just yeah, I, I feel so privileged in what I do. Um and, and and now kind of carrying my mate's memory forward. Um I feel even more determined in what I do. And what? more the reason why I do what I do and, and, and that's to to I, I saw too much over the years for for kind of walk away and knowing that other people could possibly be going through that when just a few small changes to the criminal justice system can stop that. Uh, we That's sort of uh, piggybacking on a query about someone's asking about um, if you plan to expand your story on the diamond or, or in, into an actual, you know, more of a writing career, or do you see yourself more as an advocate and a counselor for others? Um. <clears throat> It's, it's kind of split down the middle, really. Um, it's, in a way, it's what keeps me sane, um, believe it or not, um, researching and writing about organised crime. Um, I'd love to make a future from it. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's lots of people out there that, that have got 
huge credibility. They've got huge reputations. Um, I'm a small fish in a very, very big pond. So it, it's, it's, it's about enjoying it rather than anything else, really. I mean, what I do in respect to the reform work, means everything to me that's where i get my fulfillment that's where i get that sense of achievement um this is where i can receive pride because i'm really proud of this um because for me in a, in one way i'm I, i'm not trying to big myself up in any way shape or form but <laughs> i'd like to think because of my journey and because um i've done things slightly different that i'm i'm slightly more relevant to people in prison um, uh, that there is hope. You, you, it, you, it's never too late. I mean, I'm 52 this year, and here I am, I suppose, an international published author, and it's just, I can't believe what? I just said that. Well, exactly, and I mean, that's, and for someone from, from my life, um, and I've got quite a typical life in respect of people that have gone through the school-to-prison pipeline um, and got stuck in the revolving doors of our criminal justice system. So... Um, it's not as if I've kind of just, I suppose, fell into the criminal justice system and come straight back out again. It was something I was stuck in for quite a number of years. And, and that is what a lot of our criminal justice system is about. There's around about 40 percent um, that are continually uh, stuck in that revolving door, if you like. And that's the people that I want to speak to. They're the ones that listen. There is hope. Um we need change, of course, to the system. We need to make sure that there are opportunities and options available to these people um, once they've been able to change their lives. And, uh, and once, and it's not about just, just managing the risk. It's also about meeting their needs because that's where the change happens when people's needs are met. But if you manage the risk, all you're doing is, is just placing temporary respite away yeah. from the individual. You're not changing anything in in that individual so when that individual comes home again nothing's changed so if nothing's changed nothing changes so yeah i mean i'm not asking to people for people to feel sorry for people in prison um or to have empathy but i'm just asking people to understand that um yeah there are some nasty people in my prisons that's why we've got prisons i mean I, i've been in prisons i've never been an abolitionist because there are some people that deserve to be in prison that's a principle that we can never change and in one aspect, I suppose we need crime and punishment to teach us right from wrong uh, in one aspect. So, um, but yeah, it's what we do. That's that's what it comes down to. And I think it was Dostoevsky that said about how uh, society should not be judged by how it treats its outstanding citizens, but it should be judged by how it treats its prisoners. Uh, and that was something said a few hundred years ago. And here we are, if you like, having those same conversations. So, it's about time we started to, I suppose, look at our criminal justice system more from a perspective of health um, rather than just managing risk. Um, and I think we'll find that we'll soon begin to reduce reoffending and keep other people happy and being able to close our prisons. And by closing the prisons, you're obviously that's going to mean that there's going to be fewer victims. Uh, uh, and if money's your thing, the less money being spent on reducing reoffending in our prison and criminal justice system the more money we can be spent elsewhere. So it's a win-win situation just to have that little bit more of an understanding that not everyone in prison are bad people. And I suppose in, in some aspects they are or were victims themselves once. And that's why I'm not making excuses for them, but there are reasons as to why some people commit certain crimes and, and or are stuck in a, in a cycle of addiction or, uh, uh, or stuck with, with mental health and, and kind of struggling with rational decisions. So, I mean, there's a lot of other reasons behind why people commit crime than just being naughty or bad or, or wanting something that they can't have. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you actually, um, you have a, a, a blog that is, it, 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 in a way, it just sums up your whole life. What's, what's the name mm. of your blog? Uh, it's called Journey Reformed, uh, uh, Journey Reformed Man. Dot net uh, is the address. But um, yeah, I mean, it was a name that um, kind of makes sense um, because it is a journey. Uh, I, I don't really like that term myself, but there's no better way to explain it because it is a journey. Yeah. And, and for me, rehabilitation is an attitude. Um, I have to think differently these days. And for me, that's a change in my mindset. And that's what 
and why I say a reha a rehabilitation is an attitude. You don't, <laughs> in, in respect to the system itself, with certain crimes or certain levels of sentences, even from way back when, I mean, if you're under 18, you get a sentence of over four years. You've got, you've got to declare that for the rest of your life. So in the eyes of the system, you're never rehabilitated. So um, for me, rehabilitation is an attitude. It's something that you need that gets you through those, those crises that we hit. Because, listen, it's not easy getting out of jail, that's for sure. Uh, and and post-incarceration uh, post, post syndrome is now becoming a little bit more aware, um, thanks to a lady called Sheila Bruno. Uh, from America. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it's about looking at the after effects of prison because it's not as if you walk out of prison, you shake off the effects of prison, pick up your no. emotions and crack on. Um, it is a traumatic experience and it's something that, as I say, we, as a society, I'm not asking for empathy. I'm, I'm not asking that we forget. I'm just asking for a little bit more understanding, that's all. Okay. Well, no, I mean, uh, you, it's, these points are really interesting and, and uh, for, hopefully, hopefully we'll see some improvements and, and uh, oh, maybe you'll be speaking in America after COVID. Maybe you'll be on a, on a world. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows, Mitzi? Who knows? Uh, what well, can um, be? You, you, what can be exactly? Um, well, I've been I've been speaking with David Breakspear and his story, uh, "The Monk, the Brain, and the Marlboro Diamond," which is in the best new true crime stories: well mannered crooks, rogues, and criminals. David, it was really great having you on. I'm I'm so glad you were able to join me in our first first event for this book. Woo nice one, Missy. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's been, it has been an absolute pleasure and a delight. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Thank you. Bye. See you later.